Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Welcome. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-Francois Blanchet is threatening to bring down the government as early as next week. We have the details. The death toll from Hurricane Helene has now climbed to more than 200 as rescuers continue to search for survivors in the southeastern United States. And changes to WestJet flights in Lethbridge have already begun. BCN's Landon Hickok will have that story. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. MPs with the Bloc Québécois are not very happy right now. Members of the party are upset that the Trudeau Liberals rejected their motion to increase old age security pension for seniors beginning at age 65 by 10%. Bloc leader Yves-Francois Blanchet is now threatening to move toward an early election as early as next week. Blanchet says he may begin talks with other party leaders to bring down the government now that the Liberals voted against his pension bill. They have until a few days from now to go on with the royal recommendation. And if they do not, we will start as rapidly as next week to speak with other oppositions in order to get ready to go into an election. And I will, I will tell you both in English and French that it is noticeable that the NDP voted in favor of this motion and that they could have eventually to assume the consequences of such a vote if we get to the next step without the government providing us and Canadians and Quebecers with what we want. Now there's some other big news coming from our nation's capital. The Speaker of the House, Greg Fergus, ruled that all government business must be put on hold because documents related to misspent tax dollars have not yet been handed over to the RCMP. Fergus says the government did not fully comply with an order to provide thousands of unredacted documents. They relate to a now defunct foundation that was responsible for dishing out hundreds of millions of tax dollars for green technology projects. All government bills are frozen for now. Conservative House Leader Andrew Scheer says this is so Parliament can deal with what he calls liberal corruption. First, we had the case of the Green Slush Fund, the SDTC Fund, where the Auditor General found over $330 million funneled to Liberal Insider's own businesses. She found massive conflicts of interest. Basically, th these Liberal appointed board members who made the decision as to which companies got money, taxpayers' money, from this fund, were funneling that money to their own businesses or to the businesses of their close friends. So the Auditor General has blown the whistle on that, yet the government refuses to hand over the documents to the RCMP. The House of Commons passed a production order demanding that all documents, all information that the Auditor General uh, uncovered, plus any documents that might exist in any government department related to this scandal be handed over to the RCMP. The government is refusing, and as a result, the House will be seized with this corruption matter until they hand over the documents. A group of Indigenous women travelled all the way from Ecuador to speak to Canadians on Parliament Hill. They say mining by Canadian companies in their country is putting their lives and environment at risk. Canada is currently negotiating a free trade deal with Ecuador that would potentially see even more mining projects get underway. The Secretary General of Amnesty International says the group has serious concerns that they want to see addressed. The expansion and intensification of Canadian mining activity in the territory of Indigenous peoples and Campesino communities has led to the deforestation and destruction of vital wetlands forests and ancestral territories. The situation not only threatens our biodiversity, but it also endangers the life and culture of our peoples. We denounce the persecution and criminalization of environmental defenders and local communities in Ecuador, particularly in Palo Quemado, in Napa province and in Shuar territory where more than a hundred people have been prosecuted. They are not criminals, but rights defenders who are courageously resisting the advancement of the Canadian extractive industry in their territory. 
Lebanon's health minister says Israeli airstrikes that hit health facilities and workers are in violation of international law and treaties. Firaz Abiyad says this is a war crime. The World Health Organization says 28 health workers in Lebanon have been killed in the past day and is calling for a ceasefire. The WHO describes it as a dire situation in treating casualties with more than 30 health facilities closed in southern Lebanon and five hospitals that are either partly or fully evacuated in Beirut. We have more now from the Associated Press. Israeli bombing overnight caused massive destruction across Lebanon. 55 people were killed and 156 were wounded, according to the country's health ministry. One airstrike hit a high-rise in the residential Bashura district of central Beirut, killing at least nine people, seven of them health and rescue workers. The building housed an office of the Health Society, a group of civilian first responders affiliated with Hezbollah. No Israeli warning was issued to the area before it was hit. Israel and the terrorist group Hezbollah have traded fire across Lebanon almost daily since the October 7th terrorist attacks by Hamas in southern Israel. The death toll from the destruction left behind by Hurricane Helene has risen to 202. Emergency officials say more than 50 percent of those killed were in North Carolina, where entire communities were wiped out by high rushing waters. Hundreds of people are still missing since the devastating storm made landfall in Florida about a week ago. U.S. President Joe Biden visited North Carolina on Wednesday and said up to 1,000 active duty soldiers will join the North Carolina National Guard in delivering much needed supplies, including food and water, to isolated communities. A new study says hurricanes in the United States are a lot deadlier in the long run than what the federal government calculates. The average storm hitting the U.S. contributes to the early deaths of 7 to 11,000 people over a 15-year period. We study 500 hurricanes that have impacted the United States since 1930. And what we find is that after each storm, there is sort of this surge of additional mortality in a state that's been impacted that has not been previously documented or associated with hurricanes in any way. These are people who are literally maybe 10, 15 years later suffering from health issues that they may not realize are associated with the storm in some way, but which we can see in the data, they would not have died at those times had the storm not arrived. For an individual storm, we estimate that roughly seven to 11,000 additional people are dying early as a result of that storm over the subsequent 15 years. And that adds up across all storms to amount to three to five percent of all deaths in the country. What this means is that we need to think through how we respond to storms in the long term, how these communities are supported afterward, what services are provided. Well, here in southwestern Alberta, no devastating storms, fortunately, just a beautiful, clear blue sky. Jeanette Roche is now with a quick peek at the forecast. Jeanette, those who have solar panels on their homes must be loving all of the sunshine we've been receiving lately. Well, no kidding, because there seems to be plenty of it to go around, that's for sure. And it's not going away anytime soon either. In fact, over the next week, as we're looking forward, uh, lots of sunshine, lots of sunny conditions. Also, the temperature beginning to increase as well, climbing for, uh, to 23 from 15 today. Uh, what else is supposed to increase? Well, let me tell you. How about those wind gusts? So today we were relatively uh, calm conditions. Well, tomorrow those wind gusts are going to increase again uh, to 30 to 50, even up to 70 kilometers per hour. So it'll be a bit of a windy one tomorrow on Friday as we get into our weekend. And I'll be back later in the show to give you that weekend forecast. Looking forward to it. Thanks so much, Jeanette. As you've heard on Bridge City News, WestJet has approved flight changes coming in and out of our city. Executives with WestJet along with city officials were at the Lethbridge Airport to discuss these changes and as well to discuss what the future may look like when it comes to travel for our region. BCN's Landon Hickok has more now on the changes and what travelers can expect. WestJet has announced changes to their flight services to and from YQL and have begun implementing these changes this week. The changes will shorten WestJet daily flights to their hub city in Calgary from three flights a day to only one. However, they will switch from their previous smaller Saab 340s operated by Pacific Coastal Airlines to WestJet's own Encore Q400 planes. 
bringing passenger capacity from 34 seats to 78. The Q400s are newer, faster, and more fuel efficient, which will bring fare prices lower as a result. One of the things that we've heard the most from the community around our service in Lethbridge that we've had here since 2018 is concerns around the reliability of it and the inconsistency and in having seen frequent cancellations. One of the biggest reasons that we're bringing this in-house and onto a larger aircraft is because we are more confident that we can deliver a schedule more reliably for the community of Lethbridge. It's an important community, it has been since 2018, and we want to make sure that we're able to deliver effectively the schedule that we're committing to and offering the best connectivity to markets all across Canada and North America and our expansive global network. The new schedule will see YQL daily departures at 7 a.m. with a 40-minute flight to Calgary that will be connecting travelers within YYC's connection bank in the morning. The arrival to YQL would follow YYC's evening connection bank and arrive shortly after midnight. In this way, WestJet says travel efficiency would be increased to all travelers. With the major airport renovations just a few years ago, Lethbridge is also searching options with WestJet to connect to new markets directly, especially with an increasing tourism footprint. We're constantly evaluating new markets and new market opportunities, so we'll continue to work with the airport, the city and the chamber to identify if there's key markets that Lethbridge and the community members are really interested in and we'll continue to have that dialogue with them. One thing that I know we heard very often from, from many folks within the community is flights to Edmonton. Well, there's uh, uh, cost-wise, it's is less now than than what it was previously, and timelines are much quicker. I'm to Edmonton in about three and a half hours, and so you are stopping in Calgary. But understand, this is something again. I can't emphasize that enough of what we heard. This will be evaluated on a regular basis, just to to see when that opportunity is to increase airline uh, traffic through through Lethbridge. WestJet announced last month that these changes will be implemented by October the 27th, but since Thursday, they are now effective immediately. For Bridge City News, I'm Landon Hickok. You know, many Canadians have been scammed either through voicemail, text, email, or even phone calls. So how can we really protect ourselves from these fraudsters? Lethbridge Police hosted a town hall at Lakeview Elementary School on Wednesday night, warning South Lethbridge residents about traps that scammers are setting up. BCN's Heidi Echevarria was there and has the details. Fraud and fraud prevention. It was the topic discussed on the town hall that Leverage Police Service had on Wednesday night. To educate the community as a way to prevent fraud, LPS has been holding town hall meetings at different locations throughout the city. This time, the Southside community voiced their question and concern about fraud and its different forms. Sergeant Kevin Talbot, Economic Crimes Unit with LPS, explained why this town hall meeting is important. When we are seeing an increase uh, at a pocket of, of, of uh, frauds uh, that are coming across our desk, uh, we'll notify the public of what those frauds are and how to protect themselves. For example, grandparent scams, if we're seeing a rash of those, we'll notify the public that it's, uh, it's going on in our community and, uh, and some tips on how to protect themselves from those things. Most of us have probably uh, have had someone try to defraud us uh, by a phone call, a text message, or an email, or something of that nature, um, or we've been victimized ourselves. This year, as of June 30th, in Canada, the Canadian 90 Fraud Centre is reporting over almost $300 million in losses. Uh, that number has probably climbed by now up to around five, half a billion dollars just in Canada. When it comes to reporting to the Canadian 90 Fraud Centre though, only about 5% are actually reported. There's a few reasons for that. One is when people are victimized by fraud, sometimes they're embarrassed to report it. Sometimes they think the police can't do anything for them. According to Sergeant Talbot, scammers want money or information. He also said the most common scams are computer fixing, Canada Revenue Agency, emergency or grandparent, phishing, lottery, extortion, romance, investment, and artificial intelligence. Talbot explained how this works and what LPS does when it comes to fraud. Computer fixing scams, so you get a pop-up on your computer screen that asks you uh, to call a number or, or push a button or, or a link in order to fix your computer. Canada Revenue Agents, you haven't paid your taxes or they, they claim you've got a warrant for your arrest um, that often occur just before tax season. Phishing is kind of applied to every scam and this is basically when they're, the scammers are throwing out information on a text message to anybody that will respond to them. Lottery scams, the scammers will contact you claiming that you've won a prize 
and you got to pay some taxes or some fees in order to get your prize. So what is the LPS doing when it comes to frauds? Well, we're, we're training our individuals uh, internally and, ex and, and, and external resources. So we're sending, we just recently sent one of our investigators to Ottawa to a CPC investigations course on fraud. If someone tells you to lie about it while you're sending money, it's a scam. If someone tells you to keep it a secret, it's a scam as well. If you've experienced uh, being victimized yourself, spread the word to everyone and, and eventually everybody will be uh, uh, informed on how to protect themselves. For Brit City News, I'm Heidi Echavarria. Abortion continues to be a hot-button topic here in Canada. When does life begin, and what, if any, protections should the unborn be entitled to? PCN's Naveen Day sat down with a board member of the Lethbridge and District Pro-Life to discuss some of those concerns. According to Nick Outshorn, the topic is not discussed nearly enough. An event is taking place this weekend across Canada, including here in Lethbridge and across the United States, to help raise awareness. Can you just tell us, at what point does life begin? Because I know there's some differing opinions on this, but what does the science tell us? The science is extremely clear that human life clearly begins at conception. It ends at natural death. And when it comes to abortion, if we're consistent with applying human rights, uh, I think there's a very clear case to be made that human rights should apply to all human beings. And we know uh, by basic science that human life does begin at conception. How many abortions take place on, on a given day in Canada? There's a lot of obfuscation about the abortion statistics at this point, given that the government made it hard for them to be publicly found. Mm -hmm. However, when those numbers were clearly available, we were having at least approximately 300 abortions per day, wow. leading to over 100,000 abortions per year in Canada. Now, I wonder how many Canadians know what actually happens in an abortion. And I guess it depends on the age of the unborn? Yeah, different stages of development when it comes to reborn children do take different methods for abortion. By and large, the majority of Canadians have no idea what abortions do entail and how brutal it truly is. Can you just give us some highlights of what actually happens in an abortion? So a surgical abortion, uh, often they'll go in there with forceps of some kind and suction, and babies are torn limb from limb, the skulls are typically crushed to make room uh, for them to come out of the birth canal and before they're suctioned and pulled out bit by bit. And what about the mother? What are the after effects of an abortion? You know, there's a wide range there. Some women actually say that they have relief after abortion, some regret. But I think we need to acknowledge that abortion is not wrong just because it hurts women. Abortion is wrong because it kills children. And that's precisely part of the reason why it does hurt women. It hurts women psychologically because it goes against their human nature to look after their children and kill one's offspring. Now, your group has a big event uh, taking place in Lethbridge this weekend. Can you tell us about the Life Chain event? Who should attend and what actually happens at this event? So Life Chain is a bit of a uh, event where we gather together as believers and pray that God would do his work in uh, ending abortion in our country. It's very simple. We're not out there to accost anybody. We just stand there with signs, generally speaking, uh, facing traffic, showing support for the pro-life cause, and praying that God would work in Canada. Life Chain is on Sunday, October 6th. It, we're going from about 2 to 3 p.m. We're going to meet at Galt Gardens, or Japanese Gardens, sorry, at the entrance there, uh, at about 1.45 to pick up signs, start with prayer, and then get out there for an hour. Nick Outshorn is a board member of Lethbridge and District Pro-Life. Nick, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me. Well, the Crown admits that a 1974 conviction of an Indigenous man in Winnipeg was a miscarriage of justice. Clarence Woodhouse has now been acquitted in the fatal beating and stabbing of a restaurant owner in downtown Winnipeg. His conviction was largely based on a confession Woodhouse supposedly made in fluent English. His lawyers, however, argued that Woodhouse had a limited English vocabulary back then. Woodhouse spent 12 years behind bars before being eligible for parole. Minimum wage in Manitoba increased by 50 cents an hour this week. The new rate is now 15.80 an hour and was announced last spring. The wage is adjusted every year under a formula based on inflation. Labor groups have said the wage should be raised even higher because people are having a tough time making ends meet on just minimum wage alone. 
Well, it was another beautiful day here in Lethbridge. The fall temperatures will be sticking around. The warmer fall temps will be sticking around as we make our way to the weekend. Full weather details are on deck. Well, the day started off a little bit cool, but then warmed up nicely. Jeanette Roche is now with a full look at the weather picture. Jeanette, we've been enjoying a fairly warm autumn so far. Yeah, you know, Hal, it hasn't been too bad at all. Some days uh, above seasonal, some days right in that seasonal range, of course, being uh, 17 to 2 degrees. So tomorrow, well above that, uh, seeing a high of 23 degrees. And then as we get into Saturday, that's right at the seasonal high there, 17. 20 for the high on Sunday, Monday, 22. And then look at that. 28 degrees expected on Tuesday and then back to 22 Wednesday. So we're not doing so bad at all considering the average high for this time of year is that 17 degrees there. Average low uh, between two and three degrees. Uh, our record high on this day happened back in 1980. It was 28 degrees. Minus seven was the record low on this day that happened back in 1950. Sun rose this morning at 735 and the sun set this evening at 704. So we are seeing just a little under 11 and a half hours of daylight to today. Uh, tomorrow's forecast, looking at uh, rain uh, changing in the afternoon, clearing skies later on in the day in Victoria, high 15 degrees. 15 is well expected in Vancouver with rain and then clearing up later in the day. A mix of sun and cloud expected across Alberta tomorrow, 16 for the high in Edmonton and a high of 18 degrees tomorrow expected in Calgary. As we get into the rest of the prairies here, Saskatoon's high 18, 19 for the high in Regina and a high of 16 in Winnipeg. Mainly clear skies in all of those cities as well as we get to the central portion of the country. Country, Toronto seeing some rain, 21 for the high. We've got some rain and then clearing uh, in Ottawa, 21 there as well. High of 22 degrees with lovely sunny skies there. As we get to the Maritimes, Fredericton, we're going to see a high of 22 degrees, clear skies. Uh, we got mix of sun and cloud in Halifax, 20 degrees there, high of 20 in Charlottetown, and a 15 for the high in St. John's tomorrow. So there you have it. That is your forecast. A work stoppage by dock workers at two Montreal terminals ended on Thursday morning. The terminals handle more than 40% of container traffic at Canada's second largest port. The 300 loaders and checkers went on strike just before tens of thousands of dock workers walked off the job at a number of U.S. ports. Manufacturers and distributors in Canada worry that a prolonged strike in Montreal or the United States could cause severe backlogs and strand shipments of items ranging from apples to auto parts. Higher interest rates decreased housing starts by around 30,000 units in 2023. A report by the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation says the slowdown in new construction amounted to a 10 to 15 percent reduction in the number of new starts for the year. The National Housing Agency says higher rates affected new construction of condo buildings across most of the country. Officials said that the effect of higher rates was offset by other economic factors and government policies to support construction of rental buildings. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was down 33 points on the day to finish at 23,968. The Dow was down 184 points to 42,011. The S&P 500 was down 9 on the day to 5699. And the Nasdaq was down 6 points to 17,918. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 358 to 7368 US per barrel. Natural gas was up 8 cents to 297 US. Gold was down 425 on the day to 2656.07 US an ounce. And silver was up 17 cents to 32.02 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $7.89 per bushel. Barley's at 614. Canola's at 1419. And corn is at 752 per bushel. Live cattle were down $1.43 to $186. Feeder cattle were down 218 to 264.48, and lean hogs were up 90 cents to 87.33. The Canadian dollar was up slightly over the past 24 hours to 73.80 US. Recapping one of our top stories, MPs for the Bloc Québécois are not happy right now. Members of the party are upset that the Trudeau Liberals rejected their motion to increase old age security pensions for seniors beginning at the age of 65 by 10 percent. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-Francois Blanchet is now threatening to move toward an early election as early as next week. 
Blanchett says he may begin talks with other party leaders to bring down the government now that the Liberals voted against his pension bill. The Chinese tariff on Canadian canola is negatively impacting producers all across Canada. Coming up, we're going to chat with Alberta's Agriculture Minister, R.J. Sigurdsson, who's going to talk about the tariff and how it's negatively impacting farmers right here in our province. When you see news happening in your community, be sure to send us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews. You know, many would agree that our agriculture sector is the bread and butter of our economy. We rely so heavily on our farmers and producers. But where's the industry at? How healthy is it right now, especially in Alberta, and where are we headed? We're joined today by R.J. Sigurdsson, Alberta Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation, to talk a bit about the shape of our agriculture industry here in the province. Minister Sigurdsson, join us now from Edmonton. R.J., thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Great to be here, Hal. Uh, it's, uh, it's a great day to have a conversation about agriculture, uh, such an important industry to Alberta and all of Canada. Amen to that. Now, we're seeing the combines in the fields these days. Uh, what's the harvest looking like here in southern Alberta and the rest of the province? Well, we definitely were a bit concerned at the springtime this year. Uh, we had some strained years over the past three years, but we definitely saw rainfalls in the spring. Unfortunately, uh, we didn't see some of the rain uh, in July that would have been necessary to really uh, push our agricultural industry to a what I would call a bumper year. But uh, we're seeing average across the province right now. We're still waiting on a lot of the reports to come in. Uh, but definitely that, that spring rain that we saw this year definitely replenished the soil after three years of drought conditions. So it, it improved uh, dramatically uh, this year. So in your opinion, what crops kind of suffered a bit this season? Well, we definitely, uh, due to the fact that we didn't get some of the uh, midterm rains in July, uh, we definitely are seeing uh, some of the strain in our wheat, uh, definitely some strain in the barley. Uh, it just didn't get uh, that rain in the mid-year that we, you would like to generally see that is going to improve the conditions. Now, China has been discussing putting tariffs on Canadian canola in retaliation to the federal government putting a 100% tariff on Chinese-made EVs. So, RJ, how much would this really hurt our producers? I mean, I read close that they're close to, what, 70% of our canola exports go to China? Yeah, 70% of our uh, canola exports do go to China. So, definitely, this is a major concern for our farmers. Uh, it will have an impact uh, on the agricultural industry as a whole here in the province and West all of Canada. And uh, we're working closely with our federal counterparts to come to a quick resolution to this. Uh, this is very untimely. When you uh, say that the combines are in the field right now, uh, the, this couldn't have come at a worse time. So we definitely are working with our federal government right now to find a quick resolution to this and uh, support our farmers and ranchers uh, during this time. So if the spat with China continues long term, RJ, are there other trading partners we can reach out to maybe in Asia or elsewhere? Well, this has been a focus of uh, our provincial government is to take a look at the opportunities of diversifying our global trade markets. And that's why one of my first trips uh, was over to Asia to have conversations about additional pathways and strengthening, strengthening the uh, food security for those countries that have been uh, solid trading partners with Alberta and also looking at opportunities all across the globe, which is going to continue to strengthen agriculture here in the province. Now, I think it's safe to say that the majority of Alberta farmers are not in favour of the carbon tax. RJ, how is this really impacting our agriculture sector and is there anything we can really do about it? Well, um, it, it is a major impact, and it's a major impact right down to the consumer. Um, I've said that I believe there's more layers of the carbon tax on the food uh, that we buy in the grocery stores than probably any other essential, um, you know, essential commodity that people have to buy on a daily basis. Uh, we continue to have conversations with the federal government uh, to look at ending the carbon tax on all agricultural-related pro products because when we talk about food affordability, that's really all it's doing. Our agri-food processors are paying heavy uh, carbon tax uh, right down to the logistics of moving our commodities throughout the province and across the country are impacted by the carbon tax, which just does nothing but raise the price of food in the grocery store for everyday Albertans and Canadians. 
You know, it's certainly been an interesting year with drought concerns, as you mentioned earlier, and low reservoir levels, especially here in southern Alberta. But thankfully, as we talked about as well, we did receive a little bit of rainfall. Now, I know the province has been looking at ways to shore up the four pillars, share, store, conserve, and manage water. Is there anything definite in the works right now? Well, we definitely are having that conversation, understanding that uh, water is a finite resource and we have to treat it as such. So we are looking at uh, different ways to manage our water here in the province of Alberta, ensure that we are maximizing uh, on efficiency as much as possible. Uh, we're also looking at uh, investments across the board, including investing in our irrigation systems. Uh, we have uh, 933 million. Uh, that we put forward to our irrigation infrastructure modernization. Um, through that, uh, we're seeing efficiencies that is opening up new acres to irrigation. Uh, we're looking at investing in uh, feasibility studies, $5 million in the 2024 budget to take a look at additional storage options like uh, the Airmore Dam and Ardley Dam. And right down to the fact that we're working with Acadia in the special areas right now, uh, they've partnered with CIB and um, they are looking right now at a whole new irrigation district in East Central Alberta that would open up 1.8 million acres of irrigation, which is important as we continue uh, to look at the fact that the global demand for food is gonna continue to rise over the uh, decades to come. So how about some of that water sharing? How vital is that for our producers? Well, definitely um, it's incredibly important. And uh, when we look at the long-term vision here in the province about investing in air, um, you know, infrastructure to be able to increase storage and capacity, uh, that's really important in Southern Alberta. And that's why we're looking at all options available to be able to increase storage so that we can provide that stability um, when we're looking at a growing province that is seeing groves of people move here. And we're seeing... Um, some of the most uh, positive growth in the agricultural space with investments in agro-processing right now. We talk about Cavendish, McCain's, uh, p &H, uh, Mills. Uh, we, we see a lot of investment coming to the province right now, and we understand that water is uh, critical to ensure that that continues, uh, continues to happen in the future and that our farmers have the water they need to be able to uh, grow the commodities that everyday Canadians rely on. What is the outlook looking like right now for the cattle and hog sector here in the province? Well, we are, uh, of course, the, the prices on the cattle side are still high. Um, and we uh, are seeing a lot of demand continue to increase across the globe. Uh, the pork industry, of course, we've had, um, they've seen some strain in the past couple of years with the pricing side of it. We continue to work uh, with them to strengthen the industry. And as well, um, when we were over in Asia, was predominantly uh, talking to and educating uh, individuals in Asia about uh, the high quality commodities that we have here, including beef and pork, uh, and increasing market access in those areas to be able to strengthen those industries. Interesting, when Premier Daniel Smith was down at Texas recently, talking about Alberta beef versus Texas beef, and there was a little bit of an argument there. Who has the better beef? <laughs> what are well, your I think that's going to be an argument that will continue to happen for years to come. I would say that Alberta's got the best beef in, in the world, and I'll continue to support that uh, message everywhere I travel. Amen to that. <laughs> now, the federal government is wanting to see Alberta farmers significantly reduce their use of nitrogen-based fertilizers in their efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. RJ, have you been pushing back on this or complying with Ottawa? Well, I, I've been pushing back. Um, you know, our farmers and ranchers uh, use the right amount of fertilizer, and that's the message I've been uh, expressing to the federal government. Uh, we have 4R here that includes right rate, right amount, right fertilizer. These are the policies uh, that our farmers implement every single year in order to maximize their yields, which I believe is the key to sustainable farming practices and maximizing on the acres to be able to grow the most food possible. Um, at the price of fertilizer, our farmers uh, use only what they need. And, and that's to be able to make sure that they have a maximum opportunity every year to, to have the greatest yield possible. And uh, I continue to have that conversation with the federal government in making them recognize 
that our farmers and ranchers are true stewards of the land. And over the past decades, they have always done everything possible to improve soil health and to be able to, uh, you know, make sure that they recognize the importance of moving forward in the environmental and sustainable farming practices. Every farmer I talk to is focused on it. And uh, I just uh, continue to um, advocate on their behalf on the federal level to make the feds understand that we do have the greatest farmers and ranchers in the world moving forward in those environmental uh, practices. Now, speaking of which, where are we at when it comes to family farms? I know a number of farmers are retiring right now. Are we seeing more young people wanting to get involved in the agriculture sector? What kind of incentives are we maybe offering the younger generation? Well, I think one of the concerns that we do have as a provincial government, something we're keeping a close eye on, is the fact that the average age of a farmer rancher right now uh, continues to be on the rise here in Alberta. And uh, when we um, look at opportunities for the next generation to move into farming and ranching, uh, we want to continue to uh, support programs that help. And that's why our um, next generation uh, loans through AFSC, we've made some recent changes to that to uh, extend the amount available and as well the eligibility requirements to um, open that up and, and just try to get that door a little bit further open and continue to educate the next generation on how much opportunity there is in the agricultural space in the future. Now, Alberta's food processing sector is the second largest manufacturing industry here in the province, and we have a lot of it right here in southern Alberta, as we discussed earlier, and it's been expanding. Do you think we'll see that trend continue? I think that trend is going to continue. Uh, when we talk about Alberta having uh, the best uh, tax jurisdiction in all of Canada, uh, we combine that with our agri-processing -proce investment tax credit, a 12% non-refundable tax credit for those that invest, 10 million or more here in the province of Alberta. And that's why we've just seen so much investment happening uh, between P&H, uh, Imperial with their um, uh, biofuel, and we see Cavendish, McCain's expansion happening across the province. On average, we saw about a half million dollars worth of investment happening in the province of Alberta roughly every year. Uh, this year alone, we're gonna see $3.2 billion worth of investment come to the province. And we've really become a beacon for the agro-processing investment, and it's very exciting. It strengthens our agricultural industry right down to the family farm, which is it's very exciting. And that's why I continue to advocate to our youth about the opportunities in agriculture for the future. Where does Alberta rank when it comes to how much we actually produce in grains, not only being exported to other provinces, but around the world? Where do we rank, like compared to Ontario, Saskatchewan? What are your thoughts? Um, well, I would always say that uh, Western Canada is uh, the, the largest of the producers in Canada. We definitely are uh, very important to the Canadian agricultural market. Uh, when you combine Alberta and Saskatchewan, we are the lion's share of production, both of uh, cereals, pulses. Um, Alberta, of course, is the largest beef producer in all of Canada, which is something we're very proud of. But we always look at every opportunity to uh, strengthen every agricultural industry. And we look at opportunities to um, strengthen, the, um, you know, pulses is something that we've talked about as being um, a, a great opportunity for the province of Alberta. And that's why we've uh, seen uh, a lot of investment come uh, in relation to that, in uh, the Luduk area, we have a fractionation facility that's happening there to extract a pure plant protein, um, which is very exciting. So we have lots of opportunity here in Western, uh, Western Canada and definitely Alberta when it comes to all agricultural products. Now, you talk to a lot of farming families, obviously, across the province here. Are some of our farmers considering maybe doing away with certain types of traditional crops and maybe considering something more lucrative, such as hemp? I mean, hemp is used to strengthen concrete driveways, used in car parts, making clothing, maybe thinking outside the box a little bit. Yeah, just recently I did a uh, Northern Alberta tour all the way up through the Peace Country as far north as La Crete to really get my feet on the ground and take a look at what's uh, happening up there with farming operations. And we saw some exciting uh, opportunities uh, around hemp and other products. So we definitely look at every opportunity uh, we can right now in the province to uh, strengthen um, any commodity that our farmers and ranchers that think 
that they think is viable for their area. And there's certain areas of the province that hemp has a lot of opportunity and would, uh, I, I think, has uh, potential in the future for everything from car parts, as you mentioned, right down to concrete and other uh, composites. So. Now, obviously, winter's just around the corner. Some of us are dreading it. Other people are pretty excited about it, especially the skiers in my family. But let's talk, RJ, specifically about the snowpack and how vital that is for our agriculture sector. The snowpack is key. I mean, we have uh, streams and rivers that are glacier-fed, but definitely the snowpack is uh, what's required to be able to uh, fill our reservoirs every year. Those reservoirs that we rely on for industry, municipalities, and definitely uh, irrigation uh, for our farms in southern Alberta. So we keep a very close eye on that snowpack as the winter progresses. And we work uh, hand in hand with our irrigation districts to make sure that they've got uh, um, as much data and information as possible so they can manage their irrigation districts uh, efficiently and effectively every single year. And we also look at every opportunity as the province when we operate those reservoirs and dams to ensure that we bring them up to the levels uh, necessary to, to support all of our industry here in the province. Alberta's Minister of Agriculture and Irrigation, R.G. Sigurdsson, thanks so much for joining us today from beautiful Okotoks. Thank you so much, Al. Those preteen and teenage years can be daunting for both parents and the kids going through them. There are probably more distractions than ever before for young people, and they can certainly keep us from focusing on the things that matter in life. Joining us from Central Pennsylvania to chat about this and more is uh, Dana Gresh. She is the co-host of Nancy DeMoss Wolgamuth's Revive Our Hearts podcast and a best-selling author. Many of her books focus on mother-daughter relationships and the challenges that tween girls encounter. And her latest book is a Bible study called Esther, Becoming a Girl of Purpose. Great to have you with us today. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. You did so well. My <laughs> father-in-law, it's 33 years and he still calls me Dana. So okay. you know, <laughs> you're way ahead of him. We just met. <laughs> well, it's great to have you on with us today. Maybe give us a little brief a snapshot, a snapshot rather, of what your new book is about. What's your new book about? Well, it's about the book of Esther. We, yeah. um, we kind of at True Girl, True Girl is the name of the ministry I run for eight to 12 year old girls. And we keep the pulse on what moms are really concerned about for their eight to 12 year olds, as well as what are the cultural lies and untruths that are coming against those girls. And one of the things that we've really been concerned about is there's this sensation happening in our world that if you're not an influencer by the age of 15, you don't have a lot of value in life, right? Yeah. And that's not true. Most of us do not make our mark on the world by being influencers. It's just that they kind of get a lot of attention. So um, we were like, who is a woman in the Bible that really displayed purpose, but probably had to go through a season of waiting like these tween girls are going to or are in? Because they're saying, I don't have an Etsy page that's selling X. I don't have a social media page that's getting X number of followers. So we picked Esther because she did wait and she did have incredible purpose. Yeah, she did. And she was also kind of, uh, you know, competing against all the pretty girls and, and whatnot. So yeah, somewhat relatable, right? So where do you think most North American tween girls are at? And when we say tweens, of course, you were mentioning eight to 12 year olds, right? So that preteen Hard to believe that an eight-year-old is considered a tween, but would you say that most of them have a good idea of what their purpose in life is, or would that be a very small percentage? I think it's a pretty small percentage because here's what it, it gets down to. We live in a culture that really does think that we are the center of the world and we are our center of our purpose and we get to write our story. That's not true according to the scriptures. The scripture tells us that the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him. And so it's not just a duty to glorify God and to put our hands in his our lives in his hands, but we get to enjoy it. We really do get to enjoy it. And so there again, Esther is a great example of a girl who essentially she's trafficked, right? It's not 
it's not an easy book to digest and we navigate that age appropriately really well with these girls but um she is somebody who is like trafficked she's a teenager she's not where she wants to be and she's waiting god is this what my life looks like what about and then god invites her into his purpose so a lot of us are in a season of waiting. We're not the influencers. We're not making a mark on the world, it seems. But we're in a season of waiting for God to invite us to step into his plan, not our plan, in the right time. Mm -hmm. So why did you begin writing these Bible studies for tweens specifically? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that question. This is so important. Whether you do the Esther Bible study with me or some other Bible study, your tween needs to be in God's word. Um, many years ago, I wrote maybe 2018, 19, released a book called Lies Girls Believe and the Truth That Sets Them Free. And it has become a bestseller. Um, but while I was doing it, I surveyed 1,500 tween girls and their moms. And I was really alarmed to find that when I asked the moms, does your daughter read her Bible on a regular basis? Only 30% of the moms said yes. 70% said either, no, she's not reading her Bible regularly, or I don't know. And that answer actually scared me more. You don't know. Now, here's why it matters. Um, we teach our children manners, patterns, habits before their 13th birthday, because that's when they're best formed. So we teach them to say thank you. We teach them to make their bed. We teach them to brush their teeth. These become habits for life. There is no doubt in my mind that the most important habit in our life needs to be turning to God's word every single day for truth, because in our world that's so full of lies, we are going to be pulled into those lies if we don't know what the truth is. So I said then and there, I'm going to start developing tools. And one of the tools I developed was the True Girl line of Bible studies. Not only do we release Bible studies like Esther, Becoming a Girl of Purpose, but we offer them as online Bible studies. So Esther online Bible studies coming up real soon at mytruegirl.com. Wow. Okay. So what makes this book or this study book series uh, different from other books aimed at tween girls? Because there, there's a number of them out there? That's a good question too. One of the things I would say about that is that my goal in writing it wasn't for her just to do this study, but to learn to study the Bible. So we developed a system called the 4Z method of Bible study. You zoom in to find out what are the particulars? Like, what do I, what word do I need to know? And then we zoom out. What do I need to know about the city of Susa and the Israelite people and Esther and her people and all that? And then after you've learned from one section of scripture by zooming in and zooming out, you zero in, okay, God, what does it mean for my life? And then you zip it up with prayer. So we think that's going to be something girls remember the rest of their, their life, the 4Z method, zoom, zoom, zero, and zip. Yeah, no, that, that's fun for sure. So any thoughts as to when it's appropriate for tweens to start reading the Bible on their own or with mom for that matter? Okay, so here's where, let's go back to the fact that the patterns and habits that we've learned by our 13th birthday are generally the patterns and habits that we stick with for the rest of our lives. Now, there are outliers, of course, and what we believe by our 13th birthday is generally what we believe by the rest of our lives. So it's so important that it starts before 13. I know that I was eight years old when my mom handed me a daily bread, daily devotion, and she handed it to me with the expectation that I was old enough and that I could handle sitting down to read just five minutes scripture snack and the Bible verse that went with it. And so I really think somewhere between the ages of eight and 12, it's so important that we start to help our children develop that pattern on their own. This isn't family devos. This is you doing some work in God's word on your own. Mm, oh, interesting. So uh, Dana, what are the main messages in the story of Esther that you want a tween girl to walk away understanding? Well, one is, one of the lessons that she's going to learn is that God does invite us into his purpose. Um, he created us with a purpose, with a plan. He says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for a hope and a future. He's talking about us as individuals there. And so she will be invited into his plan. And again, this is so important because of the way the world right now is, is if you see people on social media, their lives are perfect, their lives are grand, everything seems to be falling into place. But at home, most of us are saying, I'm kind of in a holding pattern right now. That's pretty normal, but God will invite you in. And the holding pattern and the waiting is part of the training that he has for you. I think that's a one really important lesson. 
Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, Esther is a good one. She's probably my favorite Bible character, to be honest. Um, and, you know, Esther has some pretty big themes in it. So what conversations can moms expect to have while their daughters go through this study? Well, first of all, I want to say they're all very age appropriate. We had some age appropriate editors really work with us on how to navigate some of the you know, very difficult themes in the book of Esther. But I think one of the things that I'm really excited that moms are going to be able to talk about is the fact that nothing can thwart God's plan. So you have this book of Esther, right? And you have the people of Israel living in Susa, which is the modern day Iran, which is now not a safe place for Christians or Jewish people to live. And it wasn't then either. And when Haman, the bad guy in the book, comes up and says, hey, King Xerxes, can we just wipe these people out? He signs a decree and says, yes. Well, there was also a rule of the land that if a king signed a decree, it was irrevocable. It couldn't be changed. So here's Esther in these dire circumstances. It looks like everything is going against them and their people will be destroyed. But here's what Esther teaches us. Circumstances do not get the last say in our lives. God does. And instead of like remembering the destruction of people and remembering what happened in Susa as a bad thing, the people of Israel look back and they remember the party that they had. It's called Purim. They still celebrate it today to remember God's deliverance. So God always gets the last say in our lives. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you handle some of the, the more adult themes in the book at an age appropriate level? Well, there's a whole bunch of them. Let's take, for example, the fact that there was a eunuch assigned to Esther to take care of her and help her learn how to prepare to go visit the king. So what is a eunuch? Mm, that's not really a great conversation for an eight-year-old girl. So we have a definition in the book that's totally truthful, but it kind of navigates some of the um, some of the complications of that word. So we basically just say, hey, a eunuch was a person who was appointed to take care of the king's family members. And that person was a person who was devoted to never being married, but always caring for the king's family. So, you know, maybe when she's a teenager, it'll be more appropriate to talk to her about some of the delicate details of that. But we really found some truthful, helpful ways to navigate some of those sensitive issues. Okay. Uh, so what does it look like for a tween girl to live a purposeful life, sort of practically living that out? Well, I think it starts with her understanding that her will is to be a part of God's bigger plan. And that's another thing that Esther teaches us so wonderfully. So Esther is this little snapshot of the history of Israel, right? But God said from the beginning, not only are these people my treasured possessions, but these people will be the one to bring forth the Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we see in Esther's little slice of life that she's able to preserve that seed line for the lineage of Jesus Christ. So she's a really important character in the books of the in the book in the books of the Bible. We play a role too. Now, I don't necessarily know that my role will ever be as important as the role that Esther played, but the Lord's asked me to disciple tween girls, to teach them to love their Bibles, to love Jesus, and to live their lives to serve him. And one of the things I'm trying to teach them is that this whole mentality that the world has about, I don't know, feeling like doing what we do, that's not how it works. We do what we do because we've been assigned the task of glorifying God. And for me, sometimes that get, means getting to talk to cool, beautiful women like you, but sometimes it means crunching budget numbers. And I don't necessarily love that part of my job. I don't feel like doing that part of my job, but I understand I'm part of a bigger plan to glorify God. And so I crunch budget numbers. And I think our girls need to learn that today because we really are releasing people into the culture right now who are like, I'm going to do what I feel like doing. Well, that's not how life works. No, not <laughs> at all. Unfortunately. <laughs> are there parts of your job you wish you didn't have to do too? I mean, I mean there's parts of every job I think we wish <laughs> that we didn't have to do. You just got to kind of do what you have to do sometimes, right? Exactly. Um, Dana, any general advice for moms who are having troubles in their relationships with their tween girls? Uh, how can that relationship maybe be restored? Well, so 
Parent-child connectedness. That's a term. It's a sociological term that I came across when my girls were tweens. And it basically is the greatest risk reducer to everything your heart fears as a mama. So spending time having dinner face-to-face three to five times a week. Um, When they come home from school, really sitting down and listening. We're talking about connection. We're talking about eye contact. We're talking about making them feel like They are seen and they are heard and they are understood. Um, Sometimes as a mom, I had to push the reset button on that because I was so busy taking out the trash and juggling my job and doing everything I had to do that every now and then I had to be reminded of, oh, that's right. I'm supposed to slow down, look them in the eyes and really connect. And so sometimes when I did that, I found that the relationship really corrected too. But if you're just totally different from your daughter, Don't forget the power of prayer. Don't forget to ask the Lord, help me to understand how she's different. Help me to respond to her the way that you need me to respond to her, Lord, so that her heart is molded in your hand, not necessarily mine, but go to the Lord in prayer for your daughter. Well, that is, that's beautiful. But Dana, this book of yours, it's part of a series, including Ruth, Miriam, Mary, Esther. Is there any order that you would recommend working through? They can do them in any order they want. Um, My favorite way, though, for them to work through is on our online live Bible studies because we put mom in the driver's seat, but we're there to coach, we're there to encourage, and the girls are connecting with hundreds of other girls across the world that are loving their Bibles, and it's so good for them to experience the fact that they're not the only ones with a mom who wants them to love the Bible. There are other girls out there who are working on that same thing. Yeah. Is it best for individuals, small groups, or moms and daughters, or kind of all of the above? We always encourage moms to be involved, but sometimes they they do it as groups. So we're always thrilled when we see a big group of moms and daughters sign up and join together. But you can certainly do it just mom and daughter in your living room or your kitchen. We do it on Monday nights, and we would love for you to join us. Check it out at mytruegirl.com. I love that. That's so fun. Uh, Dana, it looks like we're about out of time here, but thanks so much for being with us today. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. God bless you. You as well. Dana Grush is the author of Esther, Becoming a Girl of a Purpose. That's available at danagrush.com. I'm Jeanette Roche. On behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News, thanks so much for watching. 